chaos, confusion, smoke, and gunshots. Horror unfolded on a packed New York City subway car during rush hour today when a lone gunman opened fire on innocent bystanders. Terrifying images of people scrambling to safety, strangers and good Samaritans pulling bleeding victims to the platform. Now the manhunt is on for the suspect who put on a gas mask, grabbed a canister, filled the subway car with gas, and then opened fire when the car pulled up to the stop in Brooklyn. What we know about the man New York's governor is calling an active shooter and the concerning revelation about the subway security cameras. I saw a lot of people coming out of a train station. Um, one of them was injured. Uh, I believe it was a lady getting shot right on her leg. She was screaming, uh, you know, she was in a lot of pain. For the first time, the president of the United States is calling Vladimir Putin's attack on Ukraine genocide. This comes as the Pentagon investigates reports of a possible chemical agent used in an attack on Mariupol where militia fighters fell ill. Inflation still soaring, now at its highest point in more than four decades, from groceries to gas to rent, which prices are on the rise and when they're expected to come back down. Still fighting the Civil War as monuments come down, some are reenacting our country's controversial history, why they defend the long-standing tradition. The South lost, why are we celebrating this? Because it's still history. Win or lose, it's still history. It's still things that we need to remember. Actor, comedian, and one of the most recognizable voices of all time, Gilbert Gottfried dies after a long illness. Tonight, we look back at his career. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you can hear the sound of my voice. An unforgettable voice that is. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Police say they do not believe that it was terrorism, but it was certainly terror-inducing. We begin tonight, of course, with the horror inside a packed New York City subway car right in the middle of morning rush hour, shattering the normalcy of the morning commute here for so many. A gunman opening fire after detonating some type of smoke flashbang on the subway car. It happened while a subway train was pulling into a station in Brooklyn Sunset at Park neighborhood. Tonight, at least 29 people are injured, 10 shot. Five of the most critical injuries have now stabilized. There is concern tonight about the level of planning and commitment to trying to kill scores of commuters. Many are saying it's a miracle that no one was killed. Sources tell ABC News that may be because the shooter's gun jammed. Authorities found this bag at the scene with that gun and commercial-grade fireworks and multiple smoke devices. Tonight, the frenetic search for the suspect, who's described as a 5'5 five five male. The NYPD is now focused on a U-Haul that a credit card found at the scene was used to rent. They've managed to trace that U-Haul to another part of Brooklyn. We have team coverage tonight. Janae Norman leads us off from near the scene in Brooklyn. Some were heading to work, others to school. Their rush hour train pulling into a Brooklyn station, but then when the doors opened, pandemonium. <laughs> Terrified commuters scrambling out of the subway car, smoke billowing behind them. 36th Street and 4th Avenue. That's where multiple people shot with an explosive device. Victims sprawled across the platform and inside the train, a fight for survival. This man helping one of the victims. The whole ordeal, the stuff of New York nightmares. Police say the shooter was a passenger on the train, initially just another face in the crowd, seen in a green construction vest mumbling to himself. New York's new police commissioner describing the moment he unleashed the smoke inside that car. As the train was pulling into the station, the subject put on a gas mask. He then opened a canister that was in his bag and then the car filled with smoke. After that, he began shooting. Passengers couldn't see, couldn't breathe. One man we spoke with thought the pops he heard were fireworks. And it's not until after the, the popping stopped, like I saw on the floor that there was a lot of blood. And I realized that fireworks can't do that much damage. There had to be gunshots. There are people literally on top of each other, crowding over each other, trying to get out of the way, trying to get not be seen. People are just, just panicking. Soon, commuters were rushing up and out of the station, streaming onto the street. I seen a couple people walk out and they just f fell in the middle of the street. You know? What did they look they, like? They all got shot. I've never seen something like this, and it was just shocking and scary. And at the same time, wondering if the gunman is here or not. Yeah. Governor Hochul warning that yes, the shooter was still out there. This person is dangerous. 
They're asking individuals to be very vigilant and alert. So this is an active shooter situation. The quiet residential neighborhood now ground zero in a massive manhunt. An army of law enforcement trying to piece together clues. This is one of the subway stations, the center of the investigation, and right next to it, a pizza parlor where investigators are checking to see if there's possibly any surveillance camera that could help the investigation. They're checking every camera in the neighborhood, but remarkably, New York officials say the camera inside the subway station itself malfunctioning. But police did find the shooter's backpack there, multiple smoke devices, and a bag of commercial grade fireworks, but no active explosives. They also recovered a 38 caliber handgun with three extended round magazines. One was empty on the floor, but one in the gun had jammed, and authorities believe that stopped the rampage and saved lives. So perhaps did some quick thinking subway workers who immediately moved another train out of the station. And I also need to acknowledge the MTA workers who had were, were had the the, fo the foresight to immediately move a train that was on the platform, the R train, out of the station so it could carry people to safety. That was that was smart thinking. Ten people were shot. Authorities say five were in critical condition, but we learned late today they've all stabilized. Authorities believe everyone will survive this. A total of 19 victims in the hospital tonight. There are a variety of other injuries from smoke inhalation to shrapnel uh, to panic from the incident. The neighborhood shaken. Classrooms told to shelter in place. I spoke with Selma Castro, who raced to her son's school. What goes through your mind knowing that your son was riding the train to school right around the time this happened? Oh, I guess scary because like 10 minutes ago, he's on the train. So he literally got to school. Yes, 10 minutes ago, yes. 10 minutes yes. before that all happened. Yes. President Biden thanking the first responders. We're grateful for all the first responders who jumped into action, including civilians civilians who didn't hesitate to help their fellow passengers and try to shield them. Governor Hochul condemning the gunman for turning a normal day into a nightmare. That sense of tranquility and normalness was disrupted, brutally disrupted by an individual so cold hearted and depraved of heart that they had. And our thanks to Janae Norman for that. We want to take you right now to a press conference that is underway. New York City's police commissioner giving us an update on the search but for the we'll subway begin. shooter with word from Gracie Mansion from the mayor of the city of New York, Eric Adams. We can't hear him. He's talking. We can't. He's talking, but we cannot hear the mayor. Okay, we want to mm -hmm. work on the audio on So they were having some technical difficulties. The mayor of New York City, who currently has COVID, uh, was trying to lead off this press conference here to give us the, the latest update on the New York City subway attack. Uh, we do see the police commissioner at the podium there. I think that they're trying to still work out their audio issues so that we can possibly hear uh, from Mayor Adams. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, we're having an audio difficulty, so what we're going to do is regroup here. Uh, we're going to cut to the police commissioner and one of the solve the audio problems we're bringing there back. Let's try this. Okay. Thank you all for attending this evening and helping us get this information out to the public. It's so important. We are truly fortunate that this was not significantly worse than it is. As we reported this afternoon, a man who was traveling on a Manhattan-bound N train opened two canisters that dispensed smoke throughout the subway car. He then shot multiple passengers as the train pulled into the 36th Street station in Sunset Park. Ten people were injured by gunfire, and an additional 13 were either uh, injured as the, they rushed to get out of the train station or they suffered smoke inhalation. Some good news is that none of the injuries appear to be life-threatening. 
As detectives processed the crime scene, they recovered a 9mm semi-automatic handgun, extended magazines, and a hatchet. Also found is a liquid we believe to be gasoline and a bag containing consumer-grade fireworks and a hobby fuse. About an hour ago, detectives located a U-Haul van in Brooklyn that we believe is connected to the suspect. At this time, we still do not know the suspect's motivation. Clearly, this individual boarded the train and was intent on violence. We are conducting a highly coordinated investigation that includes NYPD detectives, the FBI-NYPD Joint Terrorism Task Force, and the ATF, who have been instrumental in tracing the firearm and ballistics. The suspect is a dark-skinned male and was wearing a neon orange vest and a gray-colored sweatshirt. We do have a person of interest in this investigation, but we need the public assistance with additional information. We're asking anyone with information to call Crime Stoppers at 800-577-TIPS. So we were just listening there to uh, the NYPD police commissioner um, who was giving us the latest update on uh, what happened, what unfolded this morning in Brooklyn on the subway there. And it seems that we're having some, some tef technical difficulties and we'll try to rejoin that press conference live as soon as we have uh, the video and audio uh, once again. But just to recap what she was saying, uh, that they do have a person of interest. They are asking for the public's help in being able to locate what they are describing as a lone gunman. Uh, they're describing this person as a dark-skinned male. Uh, they have also zeroed in on a U-Haul van. Uh, they say they still do not know the suspect's motivation. It looks like we're going to now return you once again to this press conference in progress. Stations Seated in the second car in the rear corner was a dark-skinned male. Various descriptions of his height are given. He is heavy set, wearing an orange green nylon type construction vest. He also had on a gray hoodie, a surgical mask, and a neon green construction helmet. As the train approached the 36th Street station, witnesses state the male opened up two smoke grenades, tossed them on the subway floor brandishes a Glock 9mm handgun. He then fired that weapon at least 33 times, striking 10 people. The male then fled the scene, and detectives are actively trying to determine his whereabouts. Recovered at that scene was a Glock 17 9mm handgun, three extended Glock-type magazines. One was still in the weapon, one under a seat, and one in a backpack. We had 33 discharged shell casings, 15 bullets, five bullet fragments, two detonated smoke grenades, two non-detonated smoke grenades, a hatchet, a black garbage can, a black milk-type style rolling cart, the gasoline, and a U-Haul key. The U-Haul key at the scene led us to the recovery of a U-Haul van a short while ago in Brooklyn. The male, who we believe is the renter of this U-Haul in Philadelphia, is a Frank R. James, male 62 years old, with addresses in Wisconsin and Philadelphia. We are endeavoring to locate him to determine his connection to the subway shooting, if any. The two crime scenes, the subway and the van, are very active and are still being processed. We are asking for anyone's help with information, cell phone video, witness information, or any, if they can identify the perpetrator or the renter of this vehicle, to call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-577-TIPS. There is a $50,000 reward out right now. 25,000 from the New York City Police Foundation, 12,500 from the MTA, and 12,500 from the TWA Local 100. I just want to assure everyone 
that we in the NYPD have all our resources working this, along with our partners in the FBI and the ATF, to find this perpetrator. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Mike Driscoll. We're going to go oh, oh, the mayor? back to okay. the mayor. Uh, okay. We have resolved that issue. Mr. Mayor, we're ready for you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Commissioner and, and Chief. As we indicated, uh, today was a difficult day for New York. And days like these are playing out too often in cities across America. As mentioned this morning, we witnessed an act of violence and evil in the heart of Brooklyn, where shooter attacked a subway car full of innocent people at the 36th Street Station. We saw a quiet Tuesday morning turn the entry into a war zone as a smoke bomb was detonated and multiple shots rang out. We witnessed 20 individuals have been injured so far, as it was mentioned. And thanks to the quick thinking of the MTA crew and the bravery and cooperation of passengers, lives were saved. And thanks to our first responders, the injured were quickly taken to area hospitals and all of them are expected to recover. You know, I have been realistic and outspoken about my commitment to protecting public safety. I stand by that and will continue to do everything in my power to dam the rivers that feed the sea of violence. But this is not only a New York City problem. This rage, this violence, these guns, these relentless shooters are an American problem. And it's going to take all levels of government to solve it. It is going to take the entire nation to speak out and push back against the cult of death that has taken hold in this nation, a cult that allows innocents to be sacrificed on a daily basis. A country with buying weapons of mass destruction is as easy as picking up a piece of plywood or a garden shovel. A country where there are more guns than people. There are over 400 million guns in this country alone. The U.S. gun homicide rate is 26 times that of other high-income countries, where over 100 people die in gun violence every day. Guns are the leading cause of death for American children and teens, like the 16-year-old baby we lost in the Bronx. From schools in Columbine, Sandy Hook, and Virginia, to music festivals in Las Vegas, to nightclubs in Orlando, to movie theaters and yoga classes across the nation. These killers have used weapons of mass destruction to massacre innocent people. They control no armies or military forces, yet these individual killers terrorize our nation. I have often said that this city is not going to adapt to dysfunction. Ending gun violence means changing gun laws. We cannot clean up a flood when the water is still pouring into the basement. And we can never stop the killing if we cannot stop the guns. To be clear, we will not surrender our city to the violent few, and we will not surrender all of America to this cult of death. The sea of violence comes from many rivers. We must dam every river that feeds the greater crisis. That is the work of my life, this administration, and this police department. I will not stop until the peace we deserve becomes the reality we experience. You have my word as a former police officer, a fellow New Yorker, and your mayor, that we will end this epidemic and that will capture the individual responsible for today's attack. We will capture him and prosecute him to the full extent of the law. Thank you, NYPD, FDNY, our first responders, and the collaboration from the federal government, the state, the city agencies. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to turn it over to Assistant Special Agent in Charge at the FBI in New York office, Michael Driscoll. Thank you, Commissioner. I want to start by expressing our hopes and prayers that the victims of this event will enjoy a quick recovery. They are our primary focus right now. I also want to echo the thanks for the partnership to the NYPD, the ATF, and all the partners who are contributing to this investigation. 
Right now, the FBI and NYPD Joint Terrorism Task Force is fully engaged with this investigation, providing assistance through manpower, technical assistance, and basically everything we can throw at it. We expect the process to be a long one as we gather all possible information to track down all possible leads. And I would encourage you, as it was mentioned earlier, to please reach out to the NYPD tip line at 1-800-577-TIPS. And I would also add, as frequently the case in many of our current investigations, uh, everyone's got a cell phone in their pocket. There's a lot of video out there. If you have digital information that you'd like to share with, with us in connection with this investigation, please visit fbi.gov slash Brooklyn shooting where you can upload that information. So we are seeking the public's help. You heard mentioned before of a name of possible interest. Videos would be particularly helpful or any other additional witnesses who have yet to come forward that can provide information uh, that might help this investigation. So thank you for your participation and I thank everyone for their partnership in the course of the investigation. Thank you. We'll take a couple of questions. Your yeah, Commissioner Sewell, is it the belief that he fled on foot after abandoning the van where he's on? We are not sure where he went at this point. That is subject to investigation. We have a number of resources that are combing on foot and doing video canvases as well to determine where he went. Post. I'm sorry. No post. Uh, Mitchell, you posted videos online talking about being a victim to the mayor's mental health program. Can you talk to us about this? Do you know to the department? So based on some preliminary information, there are some postings possibly connected to our person of interest where he mentions homelessness, he mentions New York, and he does mention Mayor Adams. And as a result of that, in an abundance of caution, we're going to tighten the mayor's security detail. Yeah. So just to be clear, so this person, Frank James, he's not the person of interest that is in custody at this moment? I'm going to have an answer that. We have, we have no one in custody well, at this time. Him. No. We are looking for Frank James. We know he rented this U-Haul van. The key of that U-Haul van was found at the crime scene in the subway. And Mr. James made those social media posts? We're pouring through that, but yes, correct. And you believe he was the one in the train? Is that correct? We, we are looking to determine if he has any connection to the train. We know Mr. James rented that U-Haul truck in Philadelphia. Mr. James made those threats online? That the commissioner was speaking about online? Yes. So we're not calling them threats. He made some concerning posts or someone made some concerning posts. We cannot attribute it to that individual yet. That's under investigation. But again, in an abundance of caution, we're going to tighten the mayor's security detail. That's all. Rocco, Daily News. Does he have, does he have any connection at all to the system? Is he a TA worker and any connection whatsoever to that subway station? That is subject to investigation. We don't have that information yet. Does he have a criminal record? See that, sir? Mr. James is just a person of interest we know right now who rented that U-Haul van in Philadelphia. The keys to that U-Haul van were found in the subway in our shooter's possessions. We don't know right now if Mr. James has any connection to the subway. That's still under investigation. Uh, Chief Essek, do you have any what we call robust DNA evidence from the crime scene or the van? The crime scene still being processed now. The van is being processed, and the subway crime scene is being processed. But we, it's too early right now to tell. City Kenny? Um, can you explain where this new hall was located? Was it nearby? And also, um, I know you said um, you're investigating these videos, but... Can you confirm that it was him in the video or people that he knows? Um, we're just trying to make that connection. The, the video, the YouTube videos and the videos on Twitter, there, there's a man who posted in there, Frank James. We're still working to see if that's our person who rented the video. And where was you all located? Uh, Kings Highway in Brooklyn. Kings Highway in what intersection? 30 4th. West 4th West and Kings Highway. Is there anything more you can tell us about the content of the posts? And I know you said it wasn't a direct threat against the mayor. Can you tell us anything he said about the mayor that caused you to There were general uh, topics of concern, and I, I don't want to go into too many details about the mayor's security detail. We're just doing it uh, just to be on the safe side. And just any other details about homelessness? You mentioned that you posted about homelessness. Complaints about homelessness, complaints about New York, nothing in general. I'm sorry, just 
general comments that caused us some concern that are subject to investigation at this point. Next question. Why were there no working surveillance cameras in the station? Why did police radios not work in the station? And how much did those factors hamper this investigation? Yeah, we know that there were three stations that the video wasn't working. We're still investigating that to see why or how those, uh, whether it was a mechanical problem, electrical issue, why those videos weren't up. And the police radios? The po there was no issues with police radios. Reports that uh, for one of the first officers on the scene said his radio wasn't working and he told one of the teenagers there to call 911. Yeah, so patrol officers... So officers who work topside, if you will, in patrol precincts, when they go down the station, they have to switch frequencies. It's a UHF versus VHF. So if they didn't switch the radio over to the, U to the VHF frequency, they would not be able to transmit down in the subway station. So it's user error. It wasn't a problem with the actual radio. Bloomberg News. How many officers are assigned to the 36th Street station, and, and were there any officers in, in, in the station at all? And, and so we, we don't typically assign officers to subway stations. Officers patrol on a rotating basis. They ride trains. They come out. They patrol the stations. Patrol officers from the precincts stop, go down. They do station inspections. We've been doing that since January. So that, that station was patrolled several times today. There were no officers present in the station uh, at the time of the shooting, but it had been patrolled several times on this calendar date prior to the shooting in the early morning hours. Next question. What do we know about Mr. James and his local ties to New York City? Timmy. We know Mr. James, uh, Mr. James has addresses in Wisconsin and Philadelphia. As far as New York, still under investigation, but he's just a person of interest right now in this case. Mr. Cleo, when he entered the station and is he on video anywhere after the fact? We know the shooter was was entered the station on King's Highway. So we're asking for anybody who knows from King's Highway to 35th Street is eight stops. Anybody who sees him with any information, please call Crime Stoppers. And what was James last season? Is that, is that clear? Is he, is he on video at all? We literally have hundreds of detectives out in the field right now pouring through video at train stations, the egresses, the, the recovery sites of the vehicle. So we hope to have clearer pictures of who we believe is the shooter. Right, two more questions. CNN? About the weapon that was recovered, has that been traced back to Mr. James at all? And is there any likelihood that, or how, how confident are investigators that he is the same person that pulled the trigger today? Look, that's pull, as far as pulling the trigger, that's still under investigation as far as the firearm is concerned. We know it's not part of a multi sale. We know it's not stolen. We're working with our partners in the ATF to cr track back to the point of sale and then move forward on that gun. Hey, last last question. question. Your physical description of James, does it match the description that's already been put out today? Uh, 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 again, as I said, we there was two smoke grenades thrown. We have various descriptions of height. I gave the description out of the man with the vest. We're looking through all all possible leads on a person of interest. I, I think if you look at our social media, you'll see two photos of the person of interest. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, and just to recap, you've been listening to a live press conference with regard to a person of interest involved in the shooting at the subway station in Brooklyn this morning, right around rush hour at 830. Um, right off the top, the New York police uh, commissioner said that we're truly fortunate that this was not significantly worse than it is. We also heard uh, from the mayor there uh, who said that we will capture him and prosecute him to the fullest extent of the law. He talked about how we have more guns than people in this country. There is now a $50,000 reward for any information leading to an arrest. Uh, we also heard from the police commissioner that they are now beefing up the mayor's security detail. Uh, for more on this, we want to go to Janae. Norman, who joins us now live in Brooklyn. Janae, we were all just listening in to that press conference with the latest on the search for that subway shooter. They did name that person of interest as Frank R. James. Tell us what we know about him. 
Well, Lindsay, we know that right now they say that they have multiple detectives actively searching for him. They say that they know that he has uh, residences or addresses listed, uh, at least in Wisconsin, and they are on the search for him. But they say that what helped connect him was a U-Haul key found at the scene at the subway station here, just less than a block from where I'm standing, that then connected them to the U-Haul truck, which was found in another location uh, not too far from here in Brooklyn. And they believe that this person of interest is who rented the U-Haul van. So that is how they were able to trace back and locate this person of interest. But Lindsay, what I was really struck by in that press conference was what you, you just touched on before, how officials say this could have been so much worse and that this individual was prepared to do damage. When they say that they found a backpack at the scene, now we already knew late today that they also recovered a 38 caliber handgun with three extended rounds magazines, one empty on the floor, one in the gun that had jammed, and one under a seat on the subway. But what they told us else, what officers found at the scene, including two smoke grenades, two more that had not been, been set off, 33 dispensed shell casings. I was so shocked by that, Lindsay, that they said this individual fired 33 times, hitting at least 10 people. Fortunately, incredibly, no one uh, is expected to have life-threatening injuries and they are all expected to recover. But what they are telling us, what detectives tell us they were able to find from this individual, it sounds like this could have been so much worse. One of those extended magazines in the, in the weapon that they recovered, they say jammed. And that, uh, Lindsay, is what officials tell us could have stopped this from being so much worse. And they say he had a hatchet as well, in addition to those other items that you mentioned. Investigators also talked about how security cameras at the subway station malfunctioned uh, during this press conference. What do we know about that? Well, Lindsay, they did tell us earlier today that when they realized that those security cameras in the subway station, the 36th Street station, were not working. They, they found that they had not been sabotaged. They just simply were malfunctioning. But we saw police out here earlier at a, at a police parlor that is right outside the entrance to the subway. We saw them swarming that area this morning, not long after this happened, and we knew that they were looking for surveillance video. Now, Lindsay, in this day and age, we expect there to be cameras in so many places, especially here in New York. City right outside of the subway station here. There's a deli. There is a bagel shop. There's that pizza parlor I mentioned. Another cafe. There's a school here right behind our cameras. All of them that have that have surveillance cameras. But officials tell us that they were able to get an image of that suspect from video taken by someone who was at the scene. And we have seen some of those frightening, terrifying videos of what those people who were on the subway on the subway car, on the platform, saw unfolding this morning. One of those bystanders who decided to pull out their phone and take video captured the, that suspect on video and was able to help get that image to police, which they helped circulate and are now trying to use to find him. And of course, we heard multiple officials as they approached the podium today appeal to the public that any kind of digital evidence, any kind of cell phone video that they might have, they are asking for that, saying that nothing is too small or insignificant. Janae Norman, thank you so much for your reporting in the field all day. And now to more on the investigation, ABC's Aaron Katersky joins us now also live from the scene where he has been as well since this morning. Aaron, we heard about the U-Haul connected to the person of interest. Of course, we heard about that key, but what led police to that U-Haul? A credit card that was found right here at the scene, Lindsay. That credit card was picked up on the subway platform along with all of those other items, and the authorities determined the credit card had been used to rent a U-Haul. That U-Haul was discovered parked here in Brooklyn about four miles from the scene along King's Highway. There's a subway stop on the end train about four blocks from where the car was parked, and it's believed that that's where the suspect boarded the train. So I think that's how police are, are connecting this person of interest, trying now to determine if he is in fact the shooter. And Aaron, what do we know about the status of the victims at this point? 
Well, thankfully, they're, they're all alive. And, and when you hear about smoke grenades and 33 shots fired and 10 people suffering gunshot wounds, uh, you, you, the, your mind does go to the worst. But thankfully, we're told that, that all the people who were shot are expected to survive. Five were shot and uh, critically wounded. But uh, earlier today, we were told that all of those critical patients had been stabilized. So it looks like everyone is going to make a recovery. Non-life-threatening injuries. What a, a blessing and what has been described as could have been a lot worse. Erin Katerski, our, our thanks to you. And now we'd like to bring in New York City Councilwoman Shahana Hanif. She joins us now, her district neighbors, the Brooklyn neighborhood, where today's shooting took place. Councilwoman, we, we thank you uh, so much for joining us on what we know is a, a difficult time. I understand that you've been in close contact with the schools closest to the scene of the attack today. How are the teachers and students coping? Thank you so much, Lindsay, for having me on tonight. And it's it's been a tragic day and my team and I uh, in coordination with my colleague council member Alexa Viles my district uh, is just miles away from uh, the 36th Street station and we've got constituents neighbors students um, families um, who are devastated who are traumatized um, and so uh, my utmost priority with our team was to check in with every single school in the district. Um, some of the schools were under some form of shelter in place, as was mentioned, um, for some, if not most of the day. And um, our job as council members, and especially through uh, crises and tragic moments, is to be a resource, a proactive resource for our communities to feel safe, to feel secure, um, and to make sure that every single person, and especially our students, are accounted for. And so right now, I, um, like all New Yorkers, are waiting um, for updates, and we'll continue to share out um, detailed information as uh, we get them out to our constituents. And how are your constituents reacting to today's events? Traumatized. Traumatized, but also, you know, I want to uplift the ways in which Brooklynites stepped up. Um, what I saw in the videos, which I watched several times, is commuters helping one another, um, transit workers ready to um, shuttle off commuters in the adjacent R train that was on the other side of the station. Um, neighbors stepped up to help neighbors. We also know that there was a police officer um, on the scene in the station whose radio wasn't working and um, commuters uh, called 911. Uh, for for help and so while we're traumatized and thinking about what the safety of uh, this week will look like as we get to work as we get to school um, we are also people who will continue to look after one another um, as we respond to safety and um, assure uh, that every single neighbor in the city is is safe and not abandoned and so much that I'm sure in retrospect, people will be taking a look at all the, the malfunctions between that police officer's radio in addition to uh, the security cameras. But even before today's mass shooting, there have been concerns about a rise in violence and crime in this city and beyond. So far this year, murders are up to 26% compared to 2020. How has this impacted your district in particular? Well, right now, um, we've got uh, Brooklynites who are absolutely um, uh, aware and alert and recognize that more policing is not the way that we address um, safety and, and particularly public safety in the city. Um, even before today, New Yorkers felt unsafe. And um, from the, the beginning of COVID to uh, the beginning of this year, Asian American neighbors in the city have been impacted violently um, across incidences in our subways, um, in our neighborhoods. And so right now, um, we really ought to think about what addressing gun violence um, means and putting all hands on deck of our elected officials to address this immediately. Um, and, you know, our, my neighbors are concerned that um, with the uh, addition of a thousand more police officers in subway stations um, has not been 
has, has not significantly reduced um, the attacks that we're seeing in the stations. And so it's something that we ought to question as New Yorkers, that what are the tools that we are being presented with? What real investments are coming into our neighborhoods um, to uh, reduce violence, to remove guns off of our streets, um, and recognizing that policing will not be the way in which um, we address this. We know that policing is a response to crime, but not means of prevention. And to that point, today the governor said that she is, quote, committing the resources of the state to fighting the siege of crime. In your opinion, what needs to be done? Well, right now, um, as, as mentioned, um, beefing up our subway stations with cops um, is is not the answer. And uh, putting in real investments, and particularly as a council member, as my colleagues and I uh, respond to uh, the budget and get to a budget that is a budget that uh, adequately, equitably meets the needs of our neighbors across housing, healthcare, and education to address the root causes of crime in our city is of utmost priority for me. So right now we know that this is a complex issue. It is not a simple issue that has a simple solution. Um, but again, I want to reiterate that policing is not our way and um, my council colleagues and I are committed to making sure that our neighborhoods are safe for every single New Yorker. New York City Councilwoman Shahana Hanif, we thank you so much for your time and joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Lindsay. The NYPD is surging forces and is getting help from the FBI. And while right now it appears the shooter acted alone, the ammunition found on scene points to plans for a deadly attack. There's also serious concerns surrounding the sheer amount of planning by the suspect. ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas has more. Tonight, police closing in on this U-Haul vehicle. They want to know if it's connected to the New York subway shooter who opened fire on helpless commuters during the morning rush hour. Federal authorities have been warning about so-called lone wolves for months. People with all kinds of grievances who may be mentally unstable, acting out violently. A law enforcement bulletin obtained by ABC News calling this a coordinated attack, believing it was clearly planned, but motives remain unclear. Authorities have not confirmed if there were any accomplices. <laughs> what is clear, according to a senior law enforcement official, is that the shooter came prepared and fired indiscriminately into the smoke, apparently intending to kill as many people as possible. Today's shooting comes amid a spike in crime in many major cities. In New York City, subway crime up more than 52 percent, and overall crime rising more than 36 percent from this time last year. Across the city just last week, a 16-year-old girl was shot and killed walking home from school. In January, two NYPD officers were killed while responding to a domestic dispute. Today, Governor Kathy Hochul saying New Yorkers are tired of the spike in crime. That the people of the entire state of New York stand with the people of this city, this community, and we say no more. Local and federal law enforcement officials are sifting through evidence looking for any possible fingerprints on the recovered gun and other items discovered at the scene. And they're looking through video from witnesses and surrounding businesses hunting for anything pointing to a suspect. Of key interest tonight, that U-Haul. Was it tied to the suspect? And they're focusing on a credit card found at the scene. Lindsay? Pierre, thank you. Of course, lots of interest on that U-Haul truck. Meanwhile, as Russian shelling of Ukraine continues across the country, officials have accused Russia's military of using chemical weapons as part of their assault. The Pentagon says they're taking the threat seriously but have yet to confirm these new claims of chemical warfare. ABC's James Longman is in Kyiv for us again. Tonight, as Russian-backed forces relentlessly pummel cities in eastern Ukraine, officials are investigating reports of a possible chemical agent being used in an attack on Mariupol. A right-wing Ukrainian battalion reports a poisonous substance of unknown origin was dropped by a drone. That claim couldn't be independently verified, in part because of the intense fighting in the city. Three of their members reportedly fell ill, but they were not said to be seriously injured. The U.S. says it's watching the reports closely. We're not in a position to confirm anything. I don't think the Ukrainians are either. We had credible information that Russian forces may use a variety of riot control agents, uh, including tear gas, mixed with chemical agents that would cause uh, stronger symptoms uh, to weaken and incapacitate entrenched uh, Ukrainian fighters and civilians. 
A spokesman for the Russian-backed rebels fighting in the region denied today they've used chemical weapons in Mariupol. But yesterday, that same spokesman said on Russian TV that his forces should use chemical weapons against Ukrainian fighters to, quote, smoke the moles out. As his troops prepare for a new offensive in eastern Ukraine, President Putin was in Russia's Far East today meeting with the leader of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko. Putin declared peace talks are at a dead end and vowed to continue the invasion, saying the military operation in Ukraine is going according to plan. But in reality, Putin's forces were denied the quick victory he'd hoped for, and he's had to withdraw his troops from around the capital to reinforce his military in the east. And tonight, Ukrainian security forces say they've captured fugitive Ukrainian lawmaker Viktor Medvedchuk. Vladimir Putin is godfather to his daughter, and he's a pro-Kremlin politician who they've been searching for since the invasion began. Medvedchuk may well become a bargaining chip in any negotiations for peace here. And the capture of Viktor Medvedchuk could be really significant. He is a close ally of Vladimir Putin, so he could be used in any future prisoner swap. But beyond that, could his life, could his freedom be that important to Vladimir Putin that he makes concessions on the battlefield? Lindsay? James, thank you. The war in Ukraine is certainly putting some serious pressure on the global economy. Inflation here at home now at the highest level since 1981. Americans are paying $325 more per month for essentials than they did this time last year. Here's ABC's Maria Villarreal. Tonight, those startling numbers from the government confirming what Mary Beth Snyder is struggling with right now. Everybody is making tough choices. Retired and on a fixed income, those tough choices include asking for help. This food bank outside Dallas providing her with groceries she just can't afford. It's very humbling to be on the receiving end when you have always been on the giving side. With inflation at an eye-watering 8.5 percent, families across the country reeling from the fastest rise in prices since the Reagan administration. People are paying $325 per month more now compared to a year ago to buy the same goods and services. Factors driving the price spikes include everything from Russia's invasion of Ukraine to supply chain snafus. Record gas prices, a huge factor in inflation, too. And in an effort to bring them down, President Biden announced an emergency waiver to allow some gas stations to sell a higher blend of ethanol gas called E15 during the summer. But here's what it means. E15 is about 10 cents a gallon cheaper than E10. But it's not going to solve all our problems. But it's going to help some people. And I'm committed to whatever I can to help. Our thanks to Maria for that. And when we come back overseas tonight, China's zero COVID policy putting 25 million people on lockdown in Shanghai. Tonight, many are struggling to get food and basics, our in-depth report. Also, remembering one of the most recognizable voices in comedy. But first, as America reckons with its past and Confederate monuments come down, there's been an increase in Civil War reenactments, the fierce debate this is igniting across the South. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you.
The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. We turn now to the controversial pastime of Civil War reenactments that have actually grown in popularity since the 2020 racial reckoning protests and the removal of the Confederate statues and memorials. For some, these reenactments are a way to pay homage to American history, and for others, it's a shocking and insensitive reminder of America's dark past. ABC News' senior national correspondent Steve Osinsami takes a look. <laughs> It's a Sunday afternoon in the middle of Sweet Home, Alabama, and they're out here fighting the Civil War. It's nearly every weekend, really, in small towns, mostly across the South. The guns are real, but the bullets and the dead people are not. As early as supper on Thursdays, these families will leave their modern day lives and cell phones behind to become weekend actors in Civil War theater. And they say they haven't seen people this interested in years. They were lined up yesterday from the corner here, all the way around the road, and up the hill to the flag yesterday. That stuff's heavy. <laughs> Tanya Hazley is a camp cook and reenactor at the Battle of Janney Furness, where the South loses the fight. We have to keep the water going so we can clean the weapons, wash the dishes. She and her children are here living in cold tents under the shadow of the Confederate flag. She says she wants America to hear that they're not racists. Some people think that we're racist for doing this. Um, I had people on the northern side. My mom, mama's from Maine. My father's from the south. And so I had people on the northern side that died. I had people on the southern side that died. Jason Sumner is a high school social studies teacher and says he'll put on the uniform for six more events this spring alone. And it is an offensive history, but it's like I tell my students, it is well and good that history is offensive because if it's not, we will not develop that emotional connection to the past and we won't learn from it. The South lost, why are we celebrating this? Because it's still history. Win or lose, it's still history. It's still things that we need to remember. Keeping our history alive. They do believe that some white Americans are only now needing to remember their Civil War history after seeing the street protests nearly two years ago. And they say they can certainly understand how the murder of George Floyd by a white Minneapolis police officer changed the lens that black Americans in particular are using to look back on our country's racial history. But they tell us they still resent seeing protesters tear down Civil War monuments. There's a certain group of people in this country who feel that because their sensibilities might be offended, that everything has to change to accommodate that. And the world plan simply does not work that way. Chris Ree from Georgia is new to this old world. He says he only started traveling to see Civil War reenactments after the summer of protests. When everything happened in 2020, uh, I think what really pushed me to really want to go for the reenactments is to try to better help people understand 
the history. He's become a star in these circles and puts on the miles sharing performances that he records online. Tell me how that happened. So how did the protest get you more involved? Um, in I mean, not taking anything away from what happened in Minneapolis. I know that was a sad time. But I, I believe, you know, the, the monuments being removed and everything else was kind of like a spit in the face. Because um, I kind of looked at it like, well, these things have been around for so many years. Why of all of a sudden are we getting, you know, confused with the history that's already been written? Have you been called a racist? Yes, I have. So you're used to being called a racist? Yeah. I mean, me and my family, we get evil looks everywhere we go. I think one city that we got a lot of looks at was Selma, Alabama. There's a good reason why there are people in Selma who might find it a little racist to hold a Civil War reenactment in their city. And you'll notice this a bit with folks who say they want to honor their Civil War history, the parts of the past that they set aside. This is also history that needs to be remembered. The state troopers and sheriff's deputies who used their nightsticks to severely wound hundreds of protesters who in 1965 were marching for voting rights in Selma. The bloody scenes were beamed into American living rooms and convinced this country to change its laws. We asked everyone out here pretending to be Civil War soldiers how they explained to their black friends, for example, how this isn't a celebration of slavery and racial oppression. The answers were usually the same. But you also have to understand that they grew up in entirely different times and saw things we see as abhorrent as necessary back then. And what is truly god-awful was seen as socially acceptable. Martin O'Toole is a spokesperson for the Sons of the Confederate Veterans. His group is suing, in some cases, to stop cities from removing Civil War monuments from public places. He says it should be perfectly acceptable for people in the South to celebrate the Confederacy. On the other side of that coin, I'm trying to imagine what my life would have been like if I were alive at the time. You know, I certainly wouldn't be, you know, able to talk with you in this setting. It's just hard for people to say, you know, let's celebrate slavery. I don't see any celebration of slavery going on today. Are you seeing in your membership a greater interest now than you saw five years ago? Mm, I would see that there's more passion because they feel like they're under attack. And so that we're being told that they're the most singularly wicked and evil people that have ever lived on the planet. We're told that and, that uh, the Confederate experience was just a veil of tears for almost everybody concerned, certainly for all black people and stuff like that. But the Confederacy wasn't really that great for black people in America. To many, it's still today the very definition of white supremacy. Richard Rose is a chapter president of the NAACP in Atlanta, and he says that while we no longer have armies pointing at each other, there are still some people across the South who've been fighting the Civil War since it ended more than 150 years ago. It's a cold, cold war. It's a cold war. He's one of the black leaders trying to remove the largest Confederate monument in America, the giant carvings of three Confederate generals at Stone Mountain, east of Atlanta. The monuments, the carvings should be completely covered and destroyed. They're not works of art, and they are not historical. Completely covered and completely, destroyed, sandblasted. Completely sandblasted, dynamited. Were most of these monuments put up long after the Civil War? Long after the Civil War. Stone Mountain, for example, was not finished really until 1972, and many of them were on the heels of civil rights gains. But the man who's the chairman at Stone Mountain, who is also African-American, says that wiping the mountain clean is a bad idea. And he says state lawmakers will never let it happen. I have no problem with the carbon. M removing that carbon will not change people. Only thing gonna change people is change of heart. It's what we heard at this park in Alabama, where the actors are firing their fake cannons and fake bullets in the name of history. Near the entrance, there now sits a Civil War monument to Confederate Major John Pelham, who led the losing fight that they recreate here every year. It used to sit here on this busy road about 20 miles away in Anniston, Alabama. But today, most of the people in that city are black, and they moved the monument to this make-believe battleground 
less than three months after George Floyd was killed. On the inscription, it says that Major Pelham was gallant and beloved. Today, the young reenactor who plays him says the crowds got even bigger when the statue moved. I would say so, because they're seeing the significance that they want to pass on to their children of why these, you know, monuments, you know, should stand. The war he's fighting isn't just the fake one. The battle here is over culture, history, and truth. And the people fighting it are very real. They don't do this in Germany. They do not do it. There are no statues of Hitler, uh, and yet we remember. We know what the history was. We know what the history is. And, and none of this is about history. What country celebrates a failed insurrection against itself? And that's what all of these reenactments do. Fascinating discussion. There are thanks to Steve Osinsami for bringing it to us. Still ahead here on Prime, the tragedy tonight in North Carolina. The three-year-old swept over the edge of a waterfall. Also in South Dakota tonight, the attorney general who could be thrown from office after the House there impeached him. And how climate change is making hurricanes even rainier. We go by the numbers, but first, our tweet of the day, Rihanna and her soon-to-arrive baby gracing the cover of Vogue magazine. into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black markets, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's why we do it. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. I risked my life. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. He put himself in jeopardy for us. Welcome back. A new study finds that hurricanes in 2020 produced more rain due to climate change, a trend that's only likely to continue. Let's take a look by the numbers. The 2020 season featured a record 30 named storms, and those storms dropped 5% more rain, according to new study in Nature Communications. And for the 14 storms that reached hurricane status, rainfall was 8% heavier, according to the study's computer simulations. Scientists say that can make a big difference when it's translated over an entire storm 
season. The researchers say the atmosphere can hold about 4% more moisture for every degree the air warms, so warming global temperatures means more moisture in the air when hurricanes form. The 2020 season broke several records, including having seven named storms with winds of at least 111 miles per hour. The state of Louisiana alone was hit five times. And more than 330 people were killed by named storms in 2020, with damage climbing past $41 billion, according to NOAA. Much of the damage was caused by flooding. The 2022 hurricane season starts in seven weeks on June 1st. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The court appearance in Russia by American Trevor Reed and the new ruling by a judge in connection with his case. Also, the tributes pouring in tonight after the death of a beloved comedian. And this Autism Acceptance Month, our conversation with a nonprofit trying to make sure all communities have the support they need. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. time anytime nightline now streaming on abc news live 2020 true crime cinematic real life drama stunning the unthinkable follow the clues the hunt true crime 2020 now streaming on abc news live national parks are incredibly safe places but crime will happen my wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find. Unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Chaos unfolding on the New York City subway system during morning rush hour. <laughs> Investigators say the gunman was riding the N line going into Manhattan just before 8.30 a.m. wearing a gas mask when he set off a gas canister and opened fire, shooting innocent riders on the train and platform. <laughs> As the train was pulling into the station, the subject put on a gas mask. He then opened a canister that was in his bag, and then the car filled with smoke. After that, he began shooting. Governor Hochul warning that, yes, the shooter was still out there. This person is dangerous. This is an active shooter situation. Police closing in on this U-Haul vehicle. They want to know if it's connected to the New York subway shooter. The U-Haul key at the scene led us to the recovery of a U-Haul van a short while ago in Brooklyn. The male, who we believe is the renter of this U-Haul in Philadelphia, is a Frank R. James, male 62 years old. We are endeavoring to locate him to determine his connection to the subway shooting, if any. The two crime scenes, the subway 
and the van are very active and are still being processed. This morning, investigators hoping the shocking surveillance footage will lead them to who opened fire outside a teenager's birthday party in Texas. Through 23 seconds of uninterrupted gunfire, teens running for their lives, screaming, ducking behind cars, and tires screeching as vehicles peel away from this quiet neighborhood outside of Houston where police say a group of teens had rented out a home for a 16th birthday party. As many as 50 rounds fired from at least three different guns, striking cars and homes, but miraculously injuring only one party goer who was shot in the foot. Investigators initially saying they have no leads. A fight ensued and people started to run. That's all I've got. Former Marine Trevor Reed appearing remotely from a Russian prison camp, appealing a nine-year sentence for assaulting a police officer, a crime he and the U.S. government say he didn't commit. Reed seen for the first time since a hunger strike landed him in the hospital. We saw some uh, pictures, uh, video from a tweet this morning of him in the court. He was on video, and he looks terrible. And we're really concerned because he, he really looks thin. Uh, he, he just, just doesn't look like himself. A three-judge panel was to hear his appeal. Instead, Reed's case has been sent back to a lower court, meaning the 30-year-old will remain in Russian custody for the foreseeable future. Late Sunday afternoon, emergency calls came in about a three-year-old girl visiting the falls with her family, having been swept from the top of the falls and over the edge. Just prior to nightfall Sunday, Nevaeh Jade Newswanger's body was discovered entrapped in an area of the waterfall. Her body then recovered very early Monday morning. The unfortunate incident has officials cautioning visitors to be careful around any waterfall. The South Dakota House has impeached State Attorney General Jason Roundsburg for his misconduct involving a 2020 fatal car crash. He struck and killed a pedestrian while driving in September 2020. He initially told police he thought he hit a deer and found the body when he returned to the scene the next morning. In August, he pleaded guilty to two misdemeanors, including driving while using a mobile device. A Senate impeachment trial is expected to start next month. It takes a two-thirds majority to convict. We learned today comedian Gilbert Gottfried has died after a long illness. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you can hear the sound of my voice. He was one of the most recognizable voices in comedy, and he posted this photo just this past January with Bob Saget and Louis Anderson, paying tribute to two of his friends who both died. Gottfried was 67. Welcome back. And now to the pandemic. As cases of the Omicron subvariant BA2 are on the rise in the U.S., the CDC says today that they now make up a majority of new cases and more than 90 percent in the Northeast. And in China, the 25 million residents of Shanghai are still in lockdown as the commercial hub of the country is paralyzed once again by a major Omicron surge. As residents struggle with renewed restrictions, the city shutdown is also having a wide impact on the global economy. ABC's Britt Clinton it reports in from Hong Kong tonight. Two years into the pandemic and China is facing its worst outbreak yet. The streets of Shanghai eerily empty as 25 million residents are forced to remain in strict lockdown with no end in sight. This despite no reported deaths. The government now forced to deliver groceries to some of its residents. So my supplies are extremely scarce. I still have some some cereals left, uh, not much, but the fruits, I only have this lemon. The severe curbs testing patients, social stability, and as experts warn, are harming China's economy and the global supply chain. We are seeing um, uh, shutdowns within the region, which we know could cause delays. It is something we are closely monitoring. In March, as Omicron snuck into this financial, commercial, and shipping capital, Shanghai, once seen as China's shining model of COVID control, had vowed not to lock down. But as cases surged, the Chinese government's no tolerance zero COVID approach returned to the city in full force. At night, frustrated residents calling out to their neighbours. Drones fly in between compounds, blasting a summons for residents to get tested. 
Shanghai resident Jamie Penaloza sent this video to ABC News of her entire apartment complex leaving for the first time in days as she was about to crawl into bed. We just had to wait for a blaring loudspeaker coming outside of our window saying, everybody get down right now, get tested right now. Jamie describing the surreal scenes on her normally lively street. Everyone just kind of very calmly gliding over there. That did feel kind of very apocalyptic and strange. Jamie finishing her test spots a bus waiting. And my heart sank. We all knew those were the buses coming to get people to the uh, quarantine central sites. In China, every positive case needs to be isolated in government facility or hospital. There's no staying at home. Um, there are no showers here and we're not allowed to receive any parcels from the outside world. <laughs> In this viral video of a Shanghai hospital from earlier in lockdown, a ward full of toddlers cry, separated from their parents after testing positive for COVID. The uproar causing authorities to relax some rules. The US State Department is now advising Americans to reconsider travel to China, ordering some consulate staff to leave. The US pointing to arbitrary enforcement measures, including the risk of parents and children being separated. China responding, calling its COVID policies science-based and effective, and slamming what it described as the US's groundless accusations. But after this nearly two-week lockdown, the number of positive infections in the city still reached over 26,000, only 1,000 of those showing symptoms, and still no reported COVID deaths. Well, there are signs that it's become increasingly difficult to implement that policy, right? The, the, uh social economic cost is rising rapidly and exponentially. The economic strain apparent, with truck drivers prevented from taking goods to major shipping ports in Shanghai, the latest blockage in the global supply chain, hitting American companies from Apple to Tesla as factories are unmanned. Experts warn continuous lockdowns could see the world's second biggest economy suffer longer term damage. We know that Shanghai contributes like one quarter uh, of China's GDP, but when other countries now uh, uh, learn, are learning to coexist with the virus, China's uh, the export sector uh, will be uh, affected. So you're saying it could impact China's global competitiveness? Absolutely. The large southern port city of Guangzhou immediately ordered massive testing of its 18 million residents after detecting just three positive cases last Friday. Uh, the uh, response was heavy-handed. But China stands by the strategy. Tomsi. Analysts predict that China won't pivot to the US mindset of coexisting with the virus until 2023, in the hopes of helping President Xi Jinping secure an unprecedented third term. This week, Shanghai did begin easing some restrictions in low risk areas, but with the warning that lockdowns can snap back in place if cases are detected again. Um, one person can test positive, and that just. Uh... <laughs> That just sets the score back to zero. Our thanks to Britt for that. April is Autism Acceptance Month, and with more than 7 million people in the United States on the autism spectrum, this is a time to celebrate differences, promote inclusion, raise awareness, and help remove the stigma associated with the autism community. Joining us now is child advocate and civil rights attorney, Areva Martin, founder and president of Special Needs Network, one of the nation's leading disability, children's health, and social justice nonprofits. Areva, Thank you so much for joining us. Last year, the Autism Society of America announced its shift in terminology from Autism Awareness Month to Autism Acceptance Month. Tell us why that's important and what the new term symbolizes. Yeah, Lindsay, that's very important because one of the things we want to do in the autism community is remove the stigma. And as we want to promote awareness, we also want to promote 
inclusion and acceptance. We want the world to know, and Americans in particular, to know that people with autism are just like you and me. They are people that have feelings. They, they uh, love their family members. They want jobs. They love fun in the community. And we want people to accept them for who they are. So the shift in name was really about shifting the attitude that we have about individuals living with autism and really to make it easier for them to be integrated into their workplaces as well as into the community. And your nonprofit organization, Special Needs Network, caters to the crisis of people living with disabilities in underserved communities. What would you say are some of the greatest challenges? Yeah, the greatest challenge is, uh, unfortunately, is structural racism. There was a report out, Lindsay, last year or at the end of 2021 uh, that talked about structural racism that families, particularly black and brown families, face in terms of getting both the diagnostic test as well as getting access to services. So barriers that families uh, face, many black families in particular that were a part of this study reported going into doctor's offices and doctors not believing them when they told them about what they witnessed uh, with regards to their children and milestones that their children weren't meeting, uh, biases that people had about uh, black and brown children. What initiatives do you currently have in place to help those students uh, feel more welcomed in society? You know, one of the things that we do at Special Needs Network is we try to provide parents with the resources that they need. We have an annual conference every year. This year is coming up on April 30th, where we bring in the best and the most skilled folks uh, scientists, medical doctors, practitioners, special education attorneys to really mm -hmm. arm parents with the information they need to help them navigate these complex systems of care. And then we try to wrap our arms around parents and let them know that they're not alone, that there are resources out there for them, uh, and that they are part of a really important and special community. You've been rather candid about the fears that you have as mother of a black son on the spectrum. Uh, back in 2020, you wrote an article titled, My Son is Black and Lives with Autism. How do I protect him from police brutality? Share with us some of those concerns and what advice you might have for parents who are in a similar situation. Yeah, we know it as black parents, we have to give our kids, particularly our black sons, the talk. And that is about how they are to conduct themselves if they are stopped by police. And unfortunately, when you have a child like my son, Marty, that has a disability, that talk is even more intense because you're always concerned that a police officer may uh, call your son's name. Like my, my son, he knows his name and he knows how to respond. But if a stranger calls out to him and he doesn't respond quickly enough, I'm concerned that police officer may think that's non-compliance. He may think my son is being belligerent or being obstructionist. And so we've got to make sure that police officers know what some of the signs and symptoms are and what it's like to live with autism. And at the same time, we have to educate our children about how to interact with law enforcement. And pivoting to COVID now for a moment, a report from Autism Society revealed that people with intellectual disabilities were almost six times more likely to die from COVID-19. Access to early diagnosis and intervention slowed down at an alarm rate, as you know, during the pandemic. Do you think that we'll ever truly know how big of an impact COVID had on this population? I don't think so. And we're not even measuring the mental health issues that uh, individuals with de developmental disabilities experience, the isolation, the loss of their routines, the loss of services. We have thousands and thousands of kids, uh, families who we're trying to help. Uh, kids experienced a lot of regression during this period. So a part of what we're going to be doing at this April 30th conference is helping families understand what their legal rights are and how they regain some of those services that were lost. And lastly, Ariva, as a community, what can we do to, to try to help foster these conversations about inclusion and acceptance for, for people who are living on the spectrum? Lindsay, doing exactly what you're doing today, interviewing folks like me, talking to everyday people, uh, getting to know those people in your own family and in your own community who may be raising a child or are living with someone with autism. So this is the month where we are promoting acceptance and awareness. And I say go hug and give a big hug to someone you know who's living with autism. All right. Ariva Martin, founder and president of the Special Needs Network, we thank you so much for joining us on this very important topic. Thank you for having me. And before we go tonight, the images of the day proving that we are still New York strong. Members of the NYPD gather at the site of the subway shooting in Brooklyn and New York City firefighters coming to the scene in the Sunset Park neighborhood. First responders going toward the danger to help their four fellow New Yorkers in a time of crisis. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us.
Coming up, we're staying on top of the latest developments in connection with that mass shooting in a Brooklyn subway station. Stay with us. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Christopher Steele, the guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. It would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP pee -pee tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. <laughs> Story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. New York Lieutenant Governor Brian Benjamin was arrested today on federal corruption charges. He resigned from his position as the second in command of the state soon after his arrest. Benjamin, a former state senator, is accused of seeking campaign contributions from a real estate developer in exchange for a state grant to developers' nonprofit organization. He pled not guilty in initial court appearance. A former a police officer who stormed the Capitol during the January 6th insurrection was found guilty on all charges. Thomas Robertson was convicted on charges ranging from obstruction of an official proceeding to entering a restricted building with a dangerous weapon. And Sherry Papini, the so-called supermom from Redding, California, has admitted that she faked her own kidnapping back in 2016. She signed a plea agreement today and pled guilty to charges related to the hoax. In a statement released to ABC News, she said she is ashamed of her behavior and sorry for the pain she caused to her family and those who tried to help her. Now to the manhunt for the suspect who opened fire 33 times on board a rush hour subway car in Brooklyn this morning. Police say 62-year-old Frank James is a person of interest in the investigation. They say that they linked him to U-Haul keys found at the scene. Also recovered at the scene, a gun, magazines, grenades, fireworks, and a hatchet pointing to a devious plant. ABC's Janae Norman has more. Tonight, police searching for this man, Frank James, now a person of interest in the investigation into the mass shooting on the subway. We are endeavoring to locate him to determine his connection to the subway shooting, if any. The horror unfolding at the peak of rush hour. Some people heading to work, others to school. Their train pulling into a Brooklyn station. But then, when the doors opened, pandemonium. Terrified commuters scrambling out of the subway car, smoke billowing behind them. 36th Street and 4th Avenue. That's where multiple people shot with an explosive device. Victims sprawled across the platform and inside the train, a fight for survival. This man helping one of the victims. The whole ordeal, the stuff of New York nightmares. Police say the shooter was a passenger on the train, initially just another face in the crowd, seen in a green construction vest mumbling to himself. New York's new police commissioner describing the moment he unleashed the smoke inside that car. As the train was pulling into the station, the subject put on a gas mask. He then opened a canister that was in his bag and then the car filled with smoke. After that, he began shooting. 
passengers couldn't see, couldn't breathe. One man we spoke with thought the pops he heard were fireworks. And it's not until after the, the popping stopped, like, I saw on the floor that there was a lot of blood. And I realized that fireworks can't do that much damage. There had to be gunshots. There are people literally on top of each other, crowding over each other, trying to get out of the way, trying to get not be seen. People are just, just panicking. Soon, commuters were rushing up and out of the station, streaming onto the street. I seen a couple people walk out and they just f fell in the middle of the street. You know? What did they look they, like? They all got shot. I've never seen something like this, and it was just shocking and scary. And at the same time, wondering if the gunman is here or not. Yeah. Governor Hochul warning that yes, the shooter was still out there. This person is dangerous. They're asking individuals to be very vigilant and alert. So this is an active shooter situation. The quiet residential neighborhood now ground zero in a massive manhunt. An army of law enforcement trying to piece together clues. This is one of the subway stations, the center of the investigation, and right next to it, a pizza parlor where investigators are checking to see if there's possibly any surveillance camera that could help the investigation. They're checking every camera in the neighborhood, but remarkably, New York officials say the camera inside the subway station itself malfunctioning. But police did find the shooter's backpack there, multiple smoke devices and a bag of commercial grade fireworks, but no active explosives. They also recovered a 38 caliber handgun with three extended round magazines. One was empty on the floor, but one in the gun had jammed and authorities believe that stopped the rampage and saved lives. So perhaps did some quick thinking subway workers who immediately moved another train out of the station. And I also need to acknowledge the MTA workers who had were, were had the the, thought, the foresight to immediately move a train that was on the platform, the R train, out of the station so it could carry people to safety. That was that was smart thinking. Ten people were shot. Authorities say five were in critical condition, but we learned late today they've all stabilized. Authorities believe everyone will survive this. A total of 19 victims in the hospital tonight. There are a variety of other injuries from smoke inhalation to shrapnel uh, to panic from the incident. The neighborhood shaken. Classrooms told to shelter in place. I spoke with Selma Castro, who raced to her son's school. What goes through your mind knowing that your son was riding the train to school right around the time this happened? Oh, I guess scary because like 10 minutes ago, he's on the train. So he literally got to school. Yes, 10 minutes ago, yes. 10 minutes yes. before that all happened. Yes. President Biden thanking the first responders. We're grateful for all the first responders who jumped into action, including civilians, civilians who didn't hesitate to help their fellow passengers and try to shield them. Governor Hochul condemning the gunman for turning a normal day into a nightmare. That sense of tranquility and normalness was disrupted, brutally disrupted by an individual so cold hearted and depraved of heart that they had no caring about the individuals that they assaulted as they simply went about their daily lives. Fortunately, all non-life-threatening injuries are thanks to Janae for that. The NYPD now is surging forces and is getting help from the FBI. And while right now it appears the shooter acted alone, there is serious concern surrounding the sheer amount of planning by the suspect. ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas joins us now as investigators search for a motive. Tonight, police closing in on this U-Haul vehicle. Authorities say it's tied to that person of interest, Frank James. The male who we believe is the renter of this U-Haul in Philadelphia is a Frank R. James, male 62 years old, with addresses in Wisconsin and Philadelphia. We are endeavoring to locate him to determine his connection to the subway shooting, if any. A law enforcement bulletin obtained by ABC News calling this a coordinated attack, believing it was clearly planned, but motives remain unclear. Authorities have not confirmed if there were any accomplices. What is clear, according to a senior law enforcement official, is that the shooter came prepared and fired indiscriminately into the smoke, apparently intending to kill as many people as possible. Today's shooting comes amid a spike in crime in many major cities. In New York City, subway crime up more than 52 percent and overall crime rising more than 36 percent from this time last year. Across the city just last week, a 16-year-old girl was shot and killed walking home from school. 
In January, two NYPD officers were killed while responding to a domestic dispute. Today, Governor Kathy Hochul saying New Yorkers are tired of the spike in crime. That the people of the entire state of New York stand with the people of this city, this community, and we say no more. Local and federal law enforcement officials are sifting through evidence looking for any possible fingerprints on the recovered gun and other items discovered at the scene. And they're looking through video from witnesses and surrounding businesses hunting for anything pointing to a suspect. Of key interest tonight, that U-Haul. Was it tied to the suspect? And they're focusing on a credit card found at the scene. Lindsay? Pierre, thank you. And joining us now for additional analysis on today's attack on the New York City subway is former FBI agent and ABC News contributor Brad Garrett. Brad, thanks for joining us. It's been about 12 hours at this point since the attack this morning. What would authorities be analyzing at this point to really try to track down the suspect? Well, Lindsay and Pierre touched on some of it. I mean, you've got a wealth of potential evidence. You have an apparent weapon described as a Glock with an extended magazine at the scene. It may well give you a location or a name of the person who purchased it because the vast majority of mass shooters buy guns illegally and they buy them in true name. That's one lead. The credit card Pierre talked about linking it to the U-Haul. So if in fact the, the three things, the gun, the credit card, and the U-Haul are all linked to one person, you may well have this mass shooter. Um, and also there may be other indicators based on the name that NYPD is currently talking about, at least linked to the U-Haul, as to does he have any, I won't say history of mass shootings, but what is his history? I mean, at this point, I'm sure they've interviewed people around him. Is he from New York? Is he from someplace else? Uh, but all of that's going to go together where I believe within hours, if not the next day or so, you're going to see an arrest warrant for someone uh, and hopefully have him in custody or at least locate him shortly after the warrant's issued. Right. It seems like they at least have some addresses with connections to Philadelphia and also Wisconsin. Now, the NYPD says they are not investigating this as an act of terrorism, but does that mean it shouldn't be considered a terrorist attack? Of course, it's a terroristic act anytime you commit a mass shooting. It terrorizes people. You know, an important thing to understand, Lindsay, is whether somebody is driven by Islamic extremism, ISIS, Al Qaeda, or they're driven by some far right philosophy, um, it really doesn't matter from the standpoint that it's all usually one person that feels either justified or just mad and want to seek revenge and they feel powerless because every one of these shooters, whether it's some sort of ideology or it's just stuff in their head that they're mad at the world or mad at individuals or mad at the, the, the transit authority, if that's even relevant in this case, that it all goes back to you're really looking for the same evidence. You're really going to look for the same things to link together that I just described that are relevant to that particular crime. And so as a result, then you, you, know, you end up with a lone shooter that probably bought the gun through his, uh, you know, his true name, uh, maybe traveled to New York, maybe has a history in New York, but whatever it might be, it's all right there to solve because most mass shootings t tend to be solved for no a number of things I just mentioned. And clearly, they don't really cover their tracks because everything is driven by the event, the event of committing the act, because that's when they feel powerful. Let's face it, that's what drives us, folks, no matter what their motivation is, it's all about power. So do you feel pretty optimistic that they're going to be able to track him down in, in short order? I think so. I mean, the only thing I can think of that, that would not occur you know, many mass shooters obviously get killed at the scene. He obviously got away. Um, if he decided to take his own life, perhaps if he went to a location that they're not aware of, it may take them a while. But my sense is it's not going to take them very long before they either have him in custody or know where he is. Former FBI agent and ABC News contributor Brad Garrett, thank you so much as always, Brad.
As Russian shelling of Ukraine continues across the country, officials have accused Russia's military of using chemical weapons as part of their assault. The Pentagon says that they're taking the threat seriously, but have yet to confirm these new claims of chemical warfare. ABC's James Longman once again in Kyiv for us. Tonight, as Russian-backed forces relentlessly pummel cities in eastern Ukraine, officials are investigating reports of a possible chemical agent being used in an attack on Mariupol. A right-wing Ukrainian battalion reports a poisonous substance of unknown origin was dropped by a drone. That claim couldn't be independently verified, in part because of the intense fighting in the city. Three of their members reportedly fell ill, but they were not said to be seriously injured. The U.S. says it's watching the reports closely. We're not in a position to confirm anything. I don't think the Ukrainians are either. We had credible information that Russian forces may use a variety of riot control agents, uh, including tear gas, mixed with chemical agents that would cause uh, stronger symptoms uh, to weaken and incapacitate entrenched uh, Ukrainian fighters and civilians. A spokesman for the Russian-backed rebels fighting in the region denied today they've used chemical weapons in Mariupol. But yesterday, that same spokesman said on Russian TV that his forces should use chemical weapons against Ukrainian fighters to, quote, smoke the moles out. As his troops prepare for a new offensive in eastern Ukraine, President Putin was in Russia's Far East today meeting with the leader of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko. Putin declared peace talks are at a dead end and vowed to continue the invasion, saying the military operation in Ukraine is going according to plan. But in reality, Putin's forces were denied the quick victory he'd hoped for, and he's had to withdraw his troops from around the capital to reinforce his military in the east. And tonight, Ukrainian security forces say they've captured fugitive Ukrainian lawmaker Viktor Medvedchuk. Vladimir Putin is godfather to his daughter, and he's a pro-Kremlin politician who they've been searching for since the invasion began. Medvedchuk may well become a bargaining chip in any negotiations for peace here. Our thanks to James for that. The war in Ukraine is certainly putting some significant pressure on the global economy. Inflation here at home is now at the highest level since 1981. Americans are paying $325 more per month for essentials than they did this time last year. Here's ABC's Maria Villarreal. Tonight, those startling numbers from the government confirming what Mary Beth Snyder is struggling with right now. Everybody is making tough choices. Retired and on a fixed income, those tough choices include asking for help. This food bank outside Dallas providing her with groceries she just can't afford. It's very humbling to be on the receiving end when you have always been on the giving side. With inflation at an eye-watering 8.5 percent, families across the country reeling from the fastest rise in prices since the Reagan administration. Factors driving the price spikes include everything from Russia's invasion of Ukraine to supply chain snafus. Record gas prices, a huge factor in inflation, too. And in an effort to bring them down, President Biden announced an emergency waiver to allow some gas stations to sell a higher blend of ethanol gas called E15 during the summer. But here's what it means. E15 is about 10 cents a gallon cheaper than E10. But it's not going to solve all our problems, but it's going to help some people. And I'm committed to whatever I can to help. Our thanks to Maria for that. And now tonight to the major storm moving east tonight, bringing with it possible blizzards, high winds, fire danger, and severe storms. 18 states on alert tonight. Our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, has the latest track. Hey there, Ginger. Lindsay, as advertised, tornado watches again on the map tonight and a confirmed tornado just moments ago west of Waco. So let's go ahead and look at who's included here. It's Fort Worth, Dallas, Austin, severe thunderstorm watch. That's all along the dry line and that's going to go until 11 p.m. tonight. But there's another pocket closer to the low pressure system up in Iowa. So Fort Dodge or Mason City, southern Minnesota and even parts of eastern Kansas that in Nebraska that are on the lookout. Remember, there are blizzard conditions on the backside of this. There is a lot of power behind it. Bismarck could end up seeing record snow, more than a foot and a half, gusts up to 40 miles per hour. Then watch what happens as this expands east, uh, damaging winds overnight, and Chicago down to Shreveport, going to look for damaging winds primarily, but tornadoes could be embedded in some of those line segments. And Lindsay, it is centered there on Memphis, down through eastern Arkansas, into southern Illinois, and even Evansville, Indiana.
Some areas that have already been hard hit are thanks to Ginger. Still to come, our conversation with a man chosen to play Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in a new show about the L.A. Lakers, how his path to the big screen was not the most conventional one. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Christopher Steele, the guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. It would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. The story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. In Sri Lanka, protests in response to crippling shortages of fuel, medical supplies, and other imported goods continue to grow. Today, the governor of its central bank announced it will temporarily suspend foreign debt payments in an effort to avoid a hard default. Sri Lanka is due to start talks with the IMF on a loan program next week. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been fined for holding parties at his residence and other government buildings during the COVID-19 lockdown. He is the first city prime minister in the UK's history to break the law while in office. And in Colombia, the national police are showing off more than a thousand rare and exotic animals they saved from the black market. The sting was carried out in coordination with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in an effort to stop the trade of illegal pets. Police arrested 21 people and seized more than a million dollars worth of ocelots, turtles, snakes, and other animals. Now to the new series, Winning Time, The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty. The show is set in the early 1980s and is a story of businessman Jerry Buss, who bought the failing L.A. Lakers and turned the team into the hottest ticket in town and eventually into NBA champions. The team was led by veteran superstar Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who seemingly unimpressed by the Lakers' number one draft pick, rookie Irvin Magic Johnson. Let's take a look. You talking about him like he the boogeyman. What's up, Cap? Like this dashiki. I take a glass of orange juice with my morning paper. Separate it out by section. News first, arts and leisure, sports last. Have it at my door at six. So who did director Adam McKay pick to play the legendary Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? Dr. Solomon Hughes, PhD, a former college and pro basketball player who had given up the game years ago for the halls of academia. Dr. Hughes Solomon, he joins us now. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So you have a master's degree, a PhD, and you were teaching at Stanford and Duke and had no professional acting experience. How did you end up landing this starring role as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? 
the grace of God. No, no I mean, I, you know, honestly, I, I was, I, I've always had an interest in this space. You know, I, I grew up as someone who was a huge fan of film, TV, and theater. Um, and I actually went so far as right after I graduated from college, came down to LA and tried to explore the space. And so, um, you know, when, when the audition came my way, I tell people I was just thrilled to get an opportunity to put myself out there and get some feedback. So did you have an agent then at the time, kind of looking at some opportunities for you in the acting realm? No, no, what I was doing was, I was so up until that point, I, I was like literally checking on Craigslist to see if there were like local auditions for shorts. Um, just right. because again, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of film and TV. It's really impacted who I am personally. And so um, just look, you know, any, I, I was eager, I was curious, but nothing had, had come my way. And let's talk about your role on Winning Time. You are six foot ten inches tall, resemble Kareem Abdul-Jabbar a bit, and, and had the basketball moves already. But how did you capture the essence of this iconic athlete and activist who's who's rather complex? Right. You know, I mean, it's you know, I, I grew up in Southern California, and so I, Kareem has literally always been the center of my basketball universe, and so 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 there was some familiarity there, right? And and the other thing is, I feel like I, I've benefited from the fact that he's been pretty generous in how much he's shared about his life, his documentary on HBO, uh, the books that he's written, et cetera, just, you know, just listening to him as a speaker. We also, you know, I benefit from being in the YouTube era where you can find footage of old interviews, et cetera. Um, and so, but it, but it was fun. It was fun, you know, trying to capture the confidence of arguably one of the greatest, if not the greatest basketball player of all time. That was a little bit of a stretch because when I played the game, I, I think people would look back. I, I was a little timid as a basketball player, so really trying to embody the confidence of someone like Kareem it, it was fun. It was challenging, but it was fun. And, and when you talk about trying to embody the confidence that he had, you were already in your 40s when you had to, to start getting ready to, to play him as a pro basketball player on screen and also master his signature sky hook, uh, which apparently you practiced for several months. Tell us about that. For at least a year, because so we shot the pilot in 2019, and then because of COVID, everything was put on hold. So I found an outdoor court, and every single day got up hundreds of reps on with the right hand, with the left hand. And so, you know, well, I say there's only one person that actually mastered it, and that's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. But mm -hmm. I definitely think that my effort is is up there with the rest of them. So. And you came to Winning Time with without any acting experience at all. You were working with some of the biggest names in Hollywood, like Adam McKay, John C. Riley, and Adrian Brody. What was that process like as you made your acting debut among all those seasoned vets? Sure. So, you know, I, I, I worked in higher ed for eight years. And one of the biggest things that people talk about on campus, I mean, there's research that's been done about it, is how you create a sense of belonging, how you make people feel like they belong on the campus so that they can go on and contribute, right? As learners, as students, et cetera. And so to, to be essentially go into this portal and end up in, in the entertainment realm, one of the things that I saw come to life in, in, a, in outside of the academic setting was a, a cast of seasoned veterans, of, of producers, of, of, of writers, et cetera, who really just laid the groundwork for a very welcoming culture. I mean, just their, their willingness to talk about their journey, to share insights about the craft, was it was incredible. It, it was literally a masterclass, and so I, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And, and there was an iconic moment in, in the first episode, and, and we had a shot of it just a, a moment ago, um, where you recreate Kareem's role in the hit movie Airplane. There it is. <laughs> it, describe what that moment was like. You were playing Kareem, who was playing a movie character. Right, right. No, and that was the very first scene that I shot. So I mean, you can imagine I walked in trembling, right? But again, you know, just. Adam and Max and Rodney and Jim just really, really just went above board in terms of, you know, making me feel like I was one of the gang. And uh, you know, we shot that in the same exact pilot that they used in the in the film Airplane. And so that was a lot of fun, a lot of history there, right? So yeah, it, it, was, a, it was a good time. A lot of improv there. And, and Winning yeah. Time has now been picked up for a second season, so it sounds like yes. you're gonna be busy for a while. Are, are you putting away academia for a bit now that you've found this, this new career? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, right now, you know, I'm just, I feel like if anything that I've learned in this realm of acting is the, the importance of being present. And so really, I'm just, I'm grateful for where we've been and I'm grateful for today, obviously the news about the second season. And so that's all my energy and my attention is just, you know, how we can tell more of this story. Dr. Solomon Hughes, we thank you so much for talking with us tonight. Winning Time, The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty airs new episodes Sundays at 9 p.m. on HBO and is available to stream on HBO Max.
And still to come in these challenging times, how one man is filtering out the bad news to give us some good. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. I'm hearing a cat. Hello? Honey, I don't think it speaks English. <laughs> for this dynamic duo. <laughs> Where's this thing been all my life? Passion. She figured it out. This is awesome. Is in everything they do. There's a horse accident. I don't think you broke a bone down here. Thank goodness for that. Cat squats? Up. Uh. Down. You have to go lower. <laughs> oh, sorry. Heartland Docs. New season Saturday, April 23rd at 10 on Nat Geo Wild. We only have so long on this planet. Why not see how far you can take it? The mere fact that we're sitting here today speaks to what he's continuing to give us. Patrick was this megastar. He was a beautiful specimen of manhood. He was all about living, and I know that that's the way he wanted to go, full of life. He had so much left that he could do. He had such a genuineness. Superstar Patrick Swayze. Thursday night at 10, 9 central on ABC and stream on Hulu. She was Diva. drama, money and fame, shop amazing, the prime housewife. Then suddenly, we've seen a lot of things on The Real Housewives, but we've never seen anyone be arrested. Unpredictable rich woman. Sign me up. Money. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Focusing on the good, one Dallas man found a way to highlight happy stories happening around us, and don't we need it? Sean Giggy from our partner station WFAA has the story in tonight's Local Lowdown. <laughs> when Robert Neely of Dallas graduated with a master's in leadership and ethics, he could have landed a fancy job with a fancy title. Definitely that. But he wanted to do something even more powerful, <laughs> make people smile. If you smile at more people during the day and the reaction that they give you, like that's stunning, that can change the world. While in school, Robert spent a lot of time studying why people do the things they do. Yes. And he kept getting the same answer. I saw a golden thread that no matter who you are, where you're from, what you've been through, we as, as humans all have a desire to be loved and to love others. Nice. And he had a plan to spread that love to the world. Yeah. A plan he shared with good friend, yeah. Hunter Stensrud. Robert explained that people are consumed by bad news and they need to be reminded of all the good around them. Did you see the video of the guy? So together, he and Hunter started a company called Inspire More. It's a website where they find the most inspiring stories from around the world and share them. It's really amazed me what a small amount of hope can do for someone. It can literally change someone's day, someone's week, someone's life. Sharing the good news is amazing that we create, but um, you know, we always want to try to find ways to give back. That's why every time someone shares a post from Inspire More, it triggers a donation, money that's then given to Smile Train, a nonprofit mm -hmm. that performs corrective cleft surgeries for children. That amount of money is going to provide a lot of care for kids all over the world. It'll put more smiles on more faces than Robert could have ever imagined. Man, there is something so sweet about loving someone else. What joy does that give you to give to others, to change someone's life? Like a smile, it might just change the world. 
Our thanks to Sean for that. Don't we all need more smiles and joy? That is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. Number one news, EBC.